so much for being here. And uh, welcome to the third of the three-part lecture series uh, being delivered by Professor Jian Devi as part of the Obeyed Siddiqui Lectures 2023. Um, this has been done in collaboration with Mount Carmel. Of course, some of you have heard this for the last two days, so bear with me, but I do believe there are some new people in the audience, so please indulge me while I go through this introduction very quickly. Um, we're doing this in collaboration with Mount Carmel. All of you, um, I can't thank you enough on behalf of NCBS, uh, really. I mean, we've been seeing this over the last few days, so really thank you for doing what you do and this uh, sort of enthusiasm and commitment that you bring to the lecture series, so thank you again. Uh, my name is Benkit, and I'm part of the team at the RPS at NCBS, and you've probably met many of our team members here in the audience. Uh, we are a public collecting center for the history of science in contemporary India. We have over 100,000 objects that are accessible both in person and online. I do encourage you to check it out, and if you've never visited an archive, this is your opportunity. Um, uh, depending on traffic, it can take you every 30 to 90 minutes. Um, we, um, uh, we have four sort of broad purposes in terms of what we do. We, of course, uh, run an archive to preserve material. We uh, run an education program. Uh, we have our own research program. And, uh, of course, we um, uh, strive to sort of have a stronger public engagement and building awareness around the idea of the archive. Um, much of whatever we do in the archives, including the Obesity Geek Chair, which is sort of housed within the archives in NCBS, um, is because of a, gen a general support from TNQ Technologies. And uh, we just want to give a shout out to them for their strong commitment to supporting the public archive as a resource uh, for all of us. The Obeyed Siddiqui Chair in the History and Culture of Science uh, at the Archives at NCBS uh, was set up uh, and named after Obeyed Siddiqui, who was the founder of the Molecular Biology Unit and the co-founder of NCBS, and whose sustained vision has led to the development of NCBS to what it is today. The chair was founded to bridge gaps in the practice, history, and philosophy of science and the humanities in the positions of auditor eminent scholars whose work has spanned these disciplines and enriched our knowledge for the history and culture of science. Professor Chi and Devi was chosen as the second recipient of the Siddiqui Chair 22-23. And uh, we are very, very grateful to Professor Chi and Devi for accepting this offer and spending the year with us and uh, spending numerous uh, discussions with the students on campus and of course with all of you here in the last three days. <coughs> Uh, Professor Chi and Devi is, um, as many of you know, um, a renowned literary scholar, a historian, a social and cultural activist. He's perhaps best known for establishing the People's Linguistic Survey of India, the PLSI. But in addition to that work, of course, he's founded the Adivasi Academy and Bhasha Research and Publication Center, an organization dedicated to studying and conserving Indian languages, championing tribal art and literature, and uplifting Adivasi communities through education and financial assistance. During his time at NCBS, he's been involved in research on the prehistory and history of Indian civilization from a linguistic perspective dating back 12,000 years. Um, and actually next, uh, next week on Tuesday, I'm not mistaken, July 18th at the Bangalore International Center, there will be a book launch for his co-edited volume titled The Indians, Histories of a Civilization, which he co-edited with Tony Joseph and Ravi Kuri Sadar. The Siddiqui Chair delivers a set of lectures um, in the second half of their tenure at NCBS. And uh, we've been hearing two parts of this in the last couple of days. Uh, titled India as a Linguistic Civilization, part one, looking at heritage, part two, yesterday, looking at diversity, um, and part three today, which we're all very looking forward to, titled Future. Professor Devi, thank you once again for the time and the effort that you spent with us, and we look forward to hearing you. Close yours. I saw yesterday still there, so you might force me to be one more lecture to start stop smiling when you see. So thank you so much for your warmth, hospitality, friendship, and uh, thank you, uh, Venkat, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, actually, the introduction is so generous that when I hear it the third time, I almost start believing it. Thank you. I promise to speak on the decline of language in our time. And in that direction, I shall present before you three uh, 
uh, three issues. In 1991, the United Nations Cultural Organization, UNESCO, brought out a rather intriguing book called The Atlas of World Languages in Danger. It had a list of languages which were likely to disappear. UNESCO had, as UNESCO does, various grades, languages almost dead, almost nearly dead, somewhat dead, potentially dying, and so on. But that, that grid was not important. What was important was the year in which the book was brought up, early 90s. That's the time, and just a few years uh, earlier, the Berlin Wall had gone down. And the collapse of the Berlin Wall also indicated that the world would now on become unilateral. Earlier it was the Western world versus the uh, communist world, socialist world. It was USA versus USSR. The globe was politically, ideologically distributed between these two positions. But with the collapse of the uh, bringing down of the Berlin Wall, the USSR also start, started uh, dissolving. And in a few years' time, the world, everybody in the world found that there was only a single pointed world. The politics of other kind had started becoming somewhat dated. Just a few years prior to the collapse of the Berlin Wall, I mean, the wall did not collapse by itself. People actually went there to smash it, put it down. But before, a few years before the wall was put down, in Britain, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher became the Prime Minister. And she brought in a political philosophy which at that time her supporters felt was new and in fact her economics was known by her name. It was Thatcher, Thatcher, Thatcher economics or whatever, an awkward term was used for that. What was that economics? It was that since 1960s, after the Second World War, Britain had accepted to be a liberal state but a citizen-friendly state. There was provision for state support to those who were poor, those who were old. So a state which was willing to provide for the people was dismantled by Margaret Thatcher. And with that, within a few years' time, Privatization of school and university education became a norm, which used to be an exception. There are American universities which are founded by private foundations, even individuals, but there was state control over the universities before Mrs. Thatcher's economics became the norm. And in England, and in America, and in France, and in Germany, Germany came the very last there. But uh, in most of the Western world, privatization of education became the norm. Now, all these historical events that affected the globe, that affected the entire world, had brought to an end a certain assumption on which the modern world had rested, and that assumption was, uh, it goes way back to the 17th century, the Treaty of Westphalia, Westphalia, where the community of nations was protected by 
the community of nations. No nation was allowed to be a victim of the, the, the avarice or aggression of other, though there were wars, there was a kind of a sense of collective responsibility. And in that collective responsibility, the state or the nation had a certain guarantee of its continuation. People belonging to the state or the nation had a guarantee which in an economics which had started evolving slowly, gradually, very, very slowly though, after the French Revolution, through the entire syndicalism and Marx and socialist thought of the 19th century, providing at least a rumor of security for citizens. That rumor was dismantled by Mrs. Thatcher. And so, the citizens of nations in the what used to be a community of nation, nations uh, started fending for themselves. On one side, there was greater liberation, liberty. It became a liberal, fully liberal world in the sense an individual was allowed to become a reckless individual. But on the other side, protection given to languages by nations was taken away because the idea of the state school started fading out. Some of you who have the privilege of being old may remember that the language teachers of 1960s, 70s, 80s were very competent language teachers. But from 1990s, Students opted for study of uh, computers more than study of languages and only an odd one went to language study. The protection to languages that nations were given and protection that nations had in the community of nations became old ideas in the new realm, in the new era of unipolar I must add that nations cannot protect a language or languages because the state, the nation state does not manufacture or produce a language. People make languages. People protect them, people perpetuate them, take them forward and so on. But nations can at least opt to remain neutral, language neutral without bringing in hindrance in continuation of language. But in this new order of nations, nations had started becoming a hindrance in continuation of language. And uh, if you go back to the magazines and periodicals of 1990s, you will find a great clamor for English language, or Spanish language, or Chinese language, the largest of the languages, the first three large languages. Now Hindi has come to the third place. But English, Chinese, and Spanish, everybody wanted to study those languages. And everything was provided for study of those languages at the cost of other languages, which were, which were much older, richer in many ways, uh, languages that people spoke. <coughs> this changed the international situation was the context in which UNESCO suddenly woke up and felt that languages are fading out. And so uh, it is not related to the grammar or the prosody or uh, vocabulary or the semantics and so on, but uh, language, languages remaining alive is related to the political, national and international circumstances. I must immediately add that if you, if, if you were to uh, go for, uh, let's say, uh, do, a, uh, do a little research on the number of people who became migratory <coughs> since 1991, and you'll find that the figures have kept increasing. I used to be in Baroda in 1990s, and outside Baroda, uh, there was uh, the ring road of Baroda.
Kota city. Uh, tribals used to come for labor and stand around, uh, say, 7 in the morning, waiting for somebody to hire them. Uh, I decided to keep a diary on diary about how many people come, what are their names, what is the source of you know, their movement. From 1991 to 1999, I maintained this diary. And uh, someday I will publish it. But uh, I noticed that there was an exponential growth in the numbers of migratory people at that spot. That was only one of the spots in the country. And there would be thousands of such spots uh, on the ring roads of every big city. There would be the labor markets. The, uh, the labor markets, I am using that term uh, 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 as if you know you bring mangoes, or apples, or uh, uh, pollock, or onions, or tomatoes to sell them. These people came to be sold by the day. In the day, at the end of the day, they are free. Migration multiplied. In the new economy, migration became the second name for economic progress. And when people migrate for want of employment in their own territory, in their own location, they naturally tend to leave their language behind. Please remember, languages are not attached to us as our veins or our bones or tongues or ears attached to the body. Language is an acquisition that a, youth, a member of the human species uh, does depending on the need. And therefore, if there is no employment in your own language, people easily migrate to other language zones. The languages remain where they are or they were. People move out. When the numbers increase and asymmetrical migration happens, languages collapse. UNESCO had woken up in 1990s, early 1990s, to the collapse of languages because of increased migration, which had increased in turn because of the new turn to e in the economies of the world, which had taken place in turn because of the unipolarity of the world and the guarantee that the community of nations had given to every nation had become fragile. In that situation, why? Old languages disappear. If you look at 1991 census of India and compare it with 2001 census of India, you will notice how gravely the disappearance of languages had increased. To give you an idea, between 1961 and 2011, you know, language census. Uh, nearly 250, 270 languages have simply disappeared. 270 languages is not a small thing, is not a joke. I'll come, I'll move to the uh, second uh, uh, aspect of language disappearance. And again, that is not related to your grammar, vocabulary, semantics, and so on. And uh, it is It is related to the idea of the ideas of future that humans like to construct for themselves. You know that uh, uh, ever since uh, the, the hold of the church weakened in Europe and humans uh, started uh, grappling with the reality of the world in terms of physics, maths, chemistry and so on in more vigorously. That is, I am talking of the times of Beside and Isaac Newton or Galileo and so on. Humans have attempted to create a utopia, an idea of future, a rosy idea of future at that. A future which will be uh, definitely far superior to uh, the present. This proclivity towards 
creating utopia. It's all imagination. But humans like to do it. And over the last four centuries, they have done it again and again in various forms. As of now, there are two future scenarios before us. Broadly speaking, two future scenarios before us. I describe both these, one after the other. And uh, I'll also comment on the, the, where language stands in uh, either of those or both of those future scenarios. In the post-Second World War uh, context, when states had to and international agencies had to, more than the states, international agencies had to uh, look after people who had suffered, people who were victimized uh, due to, uh, in uh, wars as well as uh, uh, due to colonialism, the term development came up. And various ways of measuring development uh, started uh, you know, making appearance. Those terms changed from time to time. Those parameters shifted from time to time. For a while, uh, these international agencies feel that supposing uh, 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 children have uh, this much of hemoglobin as against that much of hemoglobin, the development is better. Or these many lamps, uh, sorry, uh, uh, these many buffaloes in your uh, house rather than those many buffaloes be better. Various parameters, the height, stature, weight, Hemoglobin, how many ounces of food you eat, ounce is the major, I think, which has disappeared now. Grams, yeah, grams you eat or you don't eat, calories and so on. A Russian astronaut proposed that all that is actually uh, very, uh, very erroneous. The best way to measure development is a person's access to energy. And by energy he did not mean energy in the body. By energy he meant energy that you see in these tube lights and you know bulbs here. Electricity. Power. His argument was that throughout human history groups have moved towards places all migrations in the past have been towards areas where there is greater energy availability. And therefore, humans will continue to gravitate closer to where energy is, source of energy. Based on this uh, new idea of, uh, so he said, let's see how many, how many uh, kilowatts or whatever that unit is. Uh, everybody gets and that will, that will help us in deciding irrespective of uh, uh, the uh, complexion of this you know uh, the, the, whether they're black or white or yellow or brown or heights calories and so on it will help us in deciding whether development is taking place or not based on this observation an American mathematician uh, a man called Dyson decided to figure out the ultimate in accessing energy that humans can ever achieve in future. And he proposed, it was on imagination at that time, he proposed that if we manage to build a kind of a cover around the earth, a shell around the earth, which somehow can be lifted five or ten thousand kilometers above the surface of the earth and can somehow remain there. And if we find out a way of opening it and closing it at our will through remotes in some labs, and if we can trap all the energy that we receive, our source of energy is of course the sun to which we belong, to which this, you know, the solar system to which we belong. 
that would be a wonderful stock of energy. And he calculated with his skills in maths how many trillions of times energy everybody can give. His calculation showed that if you ever got that kind of energy, then our the ability to move, motion, speed, accelerate, everything will increase. And that will make labor redundant for humans. No labor will be necessary. I don't know if some of you have read Tennyson's poem called The Lotus Eaters. The Lotus Eaters, everybody is reclining on the lotus floor. I and mean, I don't mean uh, the current uh, red of lotus, that's not true. That's different. This is 19th century lotus. It used to be very uh, human friendly. Uh, lotus eaters, they do nothing. They only drink honey, recline on lotus, and uh, pass their days uh, as if they are in some kind of perpetual uh, ceaseless heaven. Must be very boring. Dyson said that if we can access energy this way, the human life will become the life of God, life, life of course. Now this is a crazy idea and it should have been dismissed. But it was not dismissed. Scientists have been working towards it. In fact, in the Canadian, um, uh, tenders have been floated in Canada to build such a shell and somebody, some rickshaw driver from Bhopal has invested in that company. So that one day, you know, he, he can uh, trap all the energy and sell it to Indians, and then go and recline on his lotus and be a lotus eater in Bhopal. That vision of the future presents to us a dream of labor-free life for humans, allowing humans to control the cosmos drive the planets whichever way we want to drive them, uh, direct their motion and, uh, and uh, enter into a new kind of colonization of the universe. Uh, Vishwa uh, Malak, Vishwa Set, not Vishwa Guru, but Set, 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 set I mean, the, the Gujarati word, Set. There is another view of the future. And in that view, we are told that because the rate at which species are being destroyed today, which is several hundred times higher, perhaps several thousand times higher than the last round of this, four thousand times higher uh, in comparison to the last round of destruction, we might pretty soon leave this earth as a charred planet, completely burnt out planet. What in the previous round of destruction, in long, you know, uh, long back, uh, happened in 4,000 years, will happen now in one year. If the species go, if food goes, humans go. There is already, uh, I mean, you already know that uh, scientists have made uh, in London and uh, kind of uh, uh, formally or informally announced that the Anthropocene has started, uh, Holocene has ended, and uh, our footprint on the Earth can be slowed down but cannot be reversed forever. The end game has started. Two views of future. Now in both these views, where does my language fit? If the Dyson shell is built and unlimited energy is accessed by us, controlled by us, manipulated by us, and we start roaming between planets and various solar, uh, uh, various uh, 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 galaxies, the human language is of no use because it won't work there. 
On the other hand, if species dwindle, biodiversity is wiped out, very naturally the language diversity will be wiped out to our deep, deep interlinked. Inter One reason for the decline, I mean, neither in this view of the future nor in the negative, pessimistic view of the future, uh, there is much space for language. I shall now present to you a third consideration uh, uh, for you to ponder and reflect on about what is happening to language. And here I must invoke the word memory. When humans acquired language, long time back, 70,000 years I've been saying some other uh, scholars of ancient life tell me that it could be even longer than 70,000 years. But when they acquired language, they enhance two potentials in the human brain. Or uh, let me use the word mind as some kind of syno loose synonym for the brain. They enhance two potentials in the human mind. One was the ability to grasp space. The other was the ability to grasp time. Since this universe supposedly is made of space and time, language helped the human brain to grasp time and also with the help of image making ability that the eye has, image grasping ability that the eye has, or uh, space that is there. Time is handled by memory, space is handled by imagination, image making ability in that sense. By imagination I do not mean literary imagination, the kind of imagination that uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge was uh, discussing. Image making ability. With memory, the concept of the past emerges. I think I alluded to that in the first lecture. The human experience through senses, gathered through senses, sensory perceptions, is told in language. In the case of a single individual, but in the case of more than one individual, because a linguistic community requires more than one individual, in the case of more than one individual, in the case of several individuals who communicate, the sensory perception takes the form of an articulated memory. That articulated memory, I mean, to give an example, I eat a chili and my tongue burns. And you also you know, bite chili and your tongue will burn. And both of us say when you eat chili, you know, it, it burns your tongue. It's, it's, a, it's a not a palatable, it's unbearable. That statement, either which either you make or I make, becomes a collected memory. It is neither yours nor mine. It becomes, it acquires an objective form. This collected memory accumulates over generations and becomes unmanageable for any single individual. And at that stage, communities, or at that stage, let me call them society or societies, create devices or institutions for managing memory, such memory, objective memory, not a person's memory, not individual's memory, impersonal, gathered, collected, accumulated memory of the society. These institutions take various uh, external forms such as schools and colleges, museums, libraries, because all that we get in schools or colleges, in museums, in libraries is what our people before us had experienced, they stored it in the form of language, uh, in a systematic way, and brought to us. Societies develop certain methods 
to keep this memory going. Those methods are called mnemonics, memory tricks. And when this memory becomes extremely complicated, it gets segmented in the form of disciplines. Uh, in Europe, uh, this segmented, complicated memory became a problem for philosophers. Because in each discipline, a different taxonomy was being used, different classificatory method was being used. To bring all this together was necessary. And finally, Gottfried Leibniz managed to uh, generate a common platform for bringing all the methods of remembering together. Uh, distributing, interpreting, dividing, all these different fields into a very simple formula, string of 0 and 1. I have mentioned this in the first lecture also. I want to remind you that it is that that has also given rise to the artificial memory. And in the rise of artificial memory, I am not talking of artificial intelligence, just the artificial memory, the earliest stage. So AM, artificial memory has impacted human memory in a very serious way and that has, that has made us incapable of producing sufficient amount of language that is causing amnesia for many kids that is causing dyslexia for many students. These three causes, the change nature of the international community and its relation to nations, the strange ideas of the future for humans and the technology resting on, society resting on artificial memory are all at the same time impacting human languages to get them reduced in numbers but not just in numbers also in complexities one study of the english language shows that while more people in the world speak english today in comparison to say about 80 years ago george orwell's times when more people speak English globally today, they speak less English. And many of you will have noticed that a lots of words which your previous generation knew as words in currency have simply disappeared or they are no longer intelligible to the new generation. By that token, while we are sending more messages out every day, every minute, every second today, we are really sending out much less communication. We are either forwarding or receiving or uh, simply deleting. Uh, we just, uh, we are not engaging with the language phenomenon anymore. This perhaps shall continue in future. And if it does, and yesterday uh, I was speaking of Sukumar, a walk through the wordless silence earth would be a terrifying thing for all of us. After all, language gave us, I, I said in the first lecture that language was weaponized. But that weapon was not just for aggression. It was not only for control and domination. That weapon was also for mining meaning from our existence, in our existence. It is language that allows us to express extremely complex shades of human experience, extremely complex shades of our relationship with all that we are not, relationship between the consciousness and the phenomenal world. Uh, dilemma. For instance, to be or not to be, that's the question. 
language allows us to articulate that. How your artificial memory and computers are going to do that, the gray zones of human experience are far more intriguing than the clarity zones of language allowed us to create reflection about the unknown. Language also allowed us to explore the unknown and create sciences, religion, science, literature, poetry, theater, everything language based. In the first lecture I said that what the neurons do inside the brain, language is doing in the society and there is no exaggeration at all. And would you or I want our brains without neurons? They would be like empty cans of Dalda Ghee. The world without language will be of course a world and we shall still be there, but shall we ever be any different from other animals? The answer is no. Humans began their journey as homo sapiens, rising from the stock of other beings, other species, other animals, and turned themselves into an anthropological, a cultural being. Thanks to the recursive brain that we have, the, I mean, I must explain this term for students. You know, all of us, all other animals also have brains, just as we have. Perhaps some of them have other competencies which we do not have, and in that sense they may be superior. Um, I'm not. Uh, I, I have no learning in that field. Um, but the brain helps an animal in absorbing signals that come from outside, analyzing them, and also controlling the body, keeping the body in movements uh, without uh, allowing the body to lose its balance, as simple as that. But the human brain not just understands or articulates, but actually analyzes what it has understood or articulated. And that is the recursive brain. Language is a major tool in that recursion. The brain produces language, brain pro helps us to produce language. So the brain also functions not just with chemicals and blood and neurons, language is also a fuel for the brain. Once we lose the ability, we may have words. I mean, you will ask me, will all the words disappear? How is it possible? We recorded them, we got so many videos, so many audios. When I say languages may disappear, you see, there are many old things which have remained with us. The ability that we acquired in the past but have lost, it still remains with us. Some sounds will remain there. Some sounds will remain there. Uh, some sounds may even continue to make some sense. But a complex language which brings the entire society together, Within that complexity, this entire society together in that complexity uh, may get fragile and weakened. I, I, uh, my mind uh, recalls some uh, lines of a poem from a play called A Midsummer's Night, A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which talks of uh, mad people, lovers, lunatics. Lovers and poets, lunatics, lovers and lunatics, poets and lovers. Their eyes ro are roving from heaven to earth or to heaven, they, but they are of imagination compact, and they give a name and a local habitation to air nothing. The ability to give that name and local habitation is what language enables us to do. We named every corner of the cosmos that we know and have given it a local habitation in the imagination that we sh ima imagination or imaginary that we share as communities. 
without like we will want the communities will be will be a mob of reckless uh, individuals but not a community i will now come to the closing part of what i have to say the state the nation came as ideas in the hope that they would protect the people who constitute the nation the citizens but unfortunately the nation state has continued from the very inception to curb and control the citizens in the 18th century the workers who migrated from villages to cities acquired a new name in the english language the word did not exist in the english language prior to that that word was mob mob was citizens who have fallen in bad days are migrating to cities looking out for protection from the state mobs later the same people who were working in the factories and uh, because uh, uh, the term got uh, the term got entrenched in the english language uh, even a, even an art form came up called the mob art and so on. while the mobs were being absorbed in the cities the citizens were also being created in political philosophies is the same time mobs coming into a city turning into citizens the state the nation has forced citizens into becoming mobs too i'm not thinking of mob lynching and i'm quite scared of it. getting mob lynch i love my bones i'm saying that all the policies related to language culture philosophy thought and science are forcing you and me to a greater use of the mobiles the artificial memory so in that sense the users of mobiles are mobs what else they are not idols they are mobs in the times of increase regime and dominance of artificial memory neglect by the state and this kind of wild dreams of the future human languages stand at a severe threshold of permanent risk and damage i had opened these lectures by talking about mount carmel in israel not the college the real mount carmel if we look at that mount carmel very closely i mean if you ever go there one side of it is craggy steep made of flint uh, rough the other side is a slope and is is lush is green it has vegetation full of flowers trees we are today if i may use that as the metaphor for these three lectures in conclusion of these three lectures we are today at the mount carmel of language and civilization turn one way take one step forward and you can go down the steep side of the mountain and cause what will be described as a suicide go the other way slowly and you'll find some life is possible we can still protect still save still avoid the danger what is to be done is your choice my job was very small just to make you aware that a choice exists for you French writer Albert Camus has a story 
and it's about a painter who is a countryside, you know, a countryside painter, painter or writer, artist. Uh, and because he shines out in his village, he is brought to the city of Paris, and the city of Paris has uh, civil society. The city of Paris has the bourgeoisie, the uh, decadent uh, uh, class of uh, uh, people consuming talent but not having talent by themselves. And in that society, he suddenly starts realizing that he cannot produce any anything creative. He suffers. He is extremely disturbed by that. And one day people find that he has killed himself. There is a paper on his desk on which something is scribbled. People cannot make out whether that word, scribbled word is solitaire or solitaire. Whether solitaire or solitariness. Human existence always hangs between these two no, extremes. One can be extremely precarious, other can be extremely ennobly supporting, empowering. With the question of language, we have to decide in India whether the remaining thousand languages are to be protected by us or we just have to disregard their existence and go on in our life and allow them to perish. The life of those thousand languages is not the responsibility of the state. The state neither made those languages nor will feel sad if they die or happy if they survive. It is the citizen's responsibility to have solidarity with expression articulation, thought, reflection, meditation, even the silence which encases the language. But if we lose ourselves in the flow of the artificial, we have no chance. I want to thank everybody for bringing me to Mount Carmel, allowing me to bring the real Mount Carmel into this hall, I want to thank everybody for listening to me uh, and, uh, and uh, for being extremely indulgent towards me, extremely kind towards me. Uh, I shall stop now. If there are questions, I will try to answer. But when I think very seriously about the future of language, I feel a bit upset and disturbed. for being here today. I'm a first year psychology and English literature student and I want to ask why are we putting so much focus on the preservation of language when its main function is accessibility and connection. Uh, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be easier to govern a country like India if there was some uniformity? your friends or parents do not speak with you. I am not saying speak to you. But there may be times when you decide that you look like somebody and maintain silence. Disturbing, isn't it? Yes, sir. Language makes us human. I am not talking of preservation of language by encasing languages in some museums. I am talking of languages being allowed to remain in circulation and not being pushed out of circulation for no fault of theirs. After all, languages do emerge, they grow, they die. But they don't of course emerge and grow and die like buffaloes do or horses do. 
they are not a live system. Uh, language uh, is intangible social system. Uh, they are not made of any material. Language, is, language has no material basis. They are immaterial and that's non-material. But they have been a constant companion of the homo sapiens and allowed humans to advance by putting, helping in putting their thoughts out so that others can share those thoughts. Languages have helped us in making communities. I am not thinking of language A or language B, but language with L capital in general. And without language, we won't remain humans. I don't know if you like to be human or you want to homogeneous and superhuman and you know, have only um, on Skype and Facebook friendship with aliens. That's a different goal of life. Thank you, sir. Greetings. Good evening. Um, based on yesterday's thing, I just want to ask further to you. I was asking about focus in this study. Um, based on your past experience and uh, expertise and current scenario, how do you see India down the line 50 years like uh, the monolingual language and one religion or like or it's like how is it continuing that way? But, uh, Going by uh, second question also asked. But, so like uh, we have we have come um, here we have discussed the, what so many things. Just want to know how about aliens? Like we know humans we had some kind of dialects and some kind of language and some kind of communications. About aliens, we don't know much like how do they communicate through films. We are seeing like something like they exist. But they do have any, or do like aliens exist? And if they exist, and what kind of language they have that? If in case you know what Well, uh, India after 50 years <coughs> will be like India 50 years before our time. <coughs> Finding a new kind of freedom, uh, uh, multilingual country. It is it is uh, almost impossible to make all Indians speak the same one and the same language. Uh, if they do, they no longer will be Indians. They might belong to Bangalore or Bombay, but the way, I, as I said in the, my first lecture, the very being the essence of being Indian is to be multilingual. So the moment one ceases to be multilingual, one uh, one also ceases to be Indian. Uh, to be Indian does not mean to belong to a religion, to belong to a, a, a Quran area. Uh, to be an Indian means to belong to multi multiple languages, ways of thought, ways of life. So, uh, Indians will remain multilingual forever so, as long as Indians are there and languages are there in the world. Uh, the last person on the globe who will speak a language or several languages will be an Indian. By the way, the population is increasing. So, that, that also is another reason why I'm saying this. Uh, your question, please. The second question about aliens. Oh, that's very interesting. Actually, you give me a, uh, I mean, you suggest a fabulous idea to me. I should apply to Indian Council for Social Science Research for a project to decide if aliens exist or not. Uh, uh, I have not made any, but many young people. I mean, they may be, they may be, uh, I read, I read in newspapers recently and heard on television that the United States has collected uh, information on where aliens, uh, where aliens, uh, space uh, objects were spotted, and uh, and uh, possibly they are around. I tend to think this is my view, and I may be wrong, but I tend to think that in order to support that kind of vision of the future, this kind of masala has to be distributed because. There was a time when the Americans used to say that every Russian is a spy, which every Russian was not. 
or Russians used to say every American is a spy, which every American was. Uh, aliens, the, uh, you let ask the Raman Institute of Astrophysics, because they are the ones who look at the, you know, the, the galaxies and figure out the black holes and how many billions of years ago life. But to the extent we in the world have the knowledge of the process of emergence of life and evolution, uh, uh, there does not appear to be any conclusive proof about life in some other galaxy and they are communicating with us. Uh, as we lose the idea of God, as we increase losing the idea of God, we also imagine other kinds of dreams. But I am not sure if what we understand as the cosmos is absolute understanding. That is questionable. It's changing by the day, changing by the year. What I thought was matter is today some, some other thought about what matter is, all the categories of matter. Some, what I thought was a unit, today those units, standards, they've been discarded. Some other so this is an ever-growing, ever-flowing uh, uh, field of consciousness acting on the phenomena. And uh, I, uh, even if there are aliens, I would still love to be in Karnataka. Because which alien can make idlis and dosas that people in Karnataka? I would like to go there. I'm happy here. You go to the aliens, I'll stay with idli dosa. which is actually hopefully made us all think. Uh, all the three days were you know, amazing in terms of the insights you brought into the, our understanding of languages. You talk, spoke mainly about multilingualism, you talked about uh, uh, diversity and all of this in turn leads to the dignity of the individual ultimately. Uh, I just wanted to have a small factoid, more, or, more than a question to what you were saying. You mentioned the name Hansa Mehta. Now Hansa Mehta, apart from being, which I didn't know that she was part of the age schedule, um, making the languages in the age schedule, she was also the Indian representative to the United Nations for a uh, visit sent by India, by Nehru, in 1948 to be part of the committee which was set up to draft the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which is, by the way, the most translated document in the world, the most widely translated document in the world. And she was the person responsible for altering the Article 1, the wording of Article 1, which first said, all men are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And she changed that to all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And I think that's a great blow for all of us. Thank you. I just wanted to say what that. What an Indian woman can do. I think uh, languages should be saved by women, by the way. If they are allowed to speak freely and equally, and uh, equal free and what was the third word? All the human all, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. If women are allowed to live in freedom, dignity, and their rights protected, languages will be safer. Because they transmit languages to the next generation more effectively, more comprehensively than uh, uh, the terrible fathers do. Yes.
about the Tower of Babel, uh, in which earlier, even before civilizations exist, all people uh, used to speak the same languages. Their unity of language allowed them to collaborate efficiently. They decided to build the Grand Tower of the Babel. Uh, now the God saw them and saw uh, how the power uh, of the same language that they, com they could communicate easily with each other uh, brought to them. They were uh, easily able to make a tower which could re reach the heavens. Now uh, he saw that uh, the, uh, this gave them the potential to have so much power over a world that was meant to rule by the God. Before the tower was completed, God made everyone speak different languages. This made them no longer able to understand each other. The builders were unable to complete the tower. They spread out across the world, which is how linguistic and uh, cultural diversity began. Now this is just a story, but this story shows us what the power of a common language could look like. Having different languages and diversity is great, but doesn't it separate us and create boundaries? Sir, you are right that the language, uh, we, uh, that every language makes us human, but having one language uh, does the same thing. Having one uniform language is better to communicate. Thank you. Here in Mount Carmel, is there uniform for students or no? Is there or no? No. Uh, from tomorrow, if I request the principal of the college to have uniform, would you go for it or no? Um, well, I have spent the last 14 years wearing a uniform, so I don't think that would be a problem. <laughs> but you accept that the others may have different views. Yeah. And you won't insist them wearing uniform the way that answers your question. Why do you wear this tower of Babel? Very interesting. Now where those communication towers? And they can, in whichever language you speak in the device, they can translate your language into the language in which the listener wants to hear. So these towers are as good as the tower. I mean, they are bringing some uniformity. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for uh, such a wide-ranging talk and your knowledge and humor and lucidity. Um, so let's say one doesn't belong to the camp that uh, questions the importance of language and the complexity and diversity of languages that we have. But, uh, but you spend a lot of time elaborating on the importance of, of language, uh, but you also, and perhaps this is not something you can sort of address or prove over here, uh, but you didn't, uh, <clears throat> but it's an assumption that uh, that the complexity of language is dying. I mean, it's an assumption that you have come to after studying languages for so many years, but the, the, those of us who are not linguists or who are not uh, cultural anthropologists, uh, perhaps it's not such an easy conclusion to come to. Um, you know, uh, Novels are not losing their complexity, arguably. I don't know, maybe you feel they are, but... Um, so, could you... Uh, I mean, is that, is, that, is that true that you haven't spent... Is, is, it, is it an assumption, or is it... Um, no, it's a, it's a tested assumption. Uh, sorry, can, can, I, can I just... Uh, sorry to interrupt, but... Uh, so, you know, uh, say in the 90s, which you were, spoke, which you were speaking of, uh, there are many anthropologists who counter the, uh, the assumption that, uh, that cultures were becoming homogeneous. One can disagree, but I'm just saying that there are others who have, uh, who have, who have, uh, <coughs> who assume the opposite, that, that, that diversity is in fact increasing. So, uh, I mean, I'm just, uh, which is none, none of it is to negate your talk. I'm just uh, curious to know your reaction to that. And also, you may have addressed it yesterday, uh, and I, I wasn't here yesterday, so. Thank you. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is now uh, known that uh, synonyms 
are uh, becoming smaller sets of words than they used to be in the past in for many languages. Arabic, Hindi, English, I do not know of, about Chinese. The French have issued an official notice asking people to use more synonyms in their everyday conversation. And there are incentives for in France. So uh, that uh, I try to during Corona, during the COVID time, while the NCBA scientists were busy developing uh, uh, vaccines, I was doing something different. I noticed that the words for hate, hate words are increased. So I tried to count love words, words for love, affection, affinity, uh, warmth in Indian languages. And I did a very, very rapid, quick survey in many languages. And uh, I noticed that while the words for love still exist in Indian languages, I mean, that was very reassuring. Some words are still around. Not every word has disappeared. But the number of words available were fewer than they were, say, in the times of Gali, that's end of the, let's say, second half of the 19th century, the, uh, what we find in Marathi, Gujarati, Urdu, Telugu, and so on. And uh, that was a shocker for me. I, did, I thought uh, we uh, have better means, we have got better means, better jeans, better t-shirts, better uh, uh, car, greeting cards, and messages we send, I love you, I love this, I but a hundred years later, we are becoming deficient in words for love. In the family, uh, the family, father, mother, son, daughter, four of them, all the four of them have their mobiles, they look at the mobile, over dinner, they don't talk to each other. I, mean, I don't have to describe this, this is the everyday experience. Anthropologists, have described a enhanced sense of identity among communities. But linguists are genuinely worried about uh, depletion of language stock. And it's not just the number of words, it is the language ability, the suppleness. Uh, many forms of past tense have disappeared in many languages. And that's quite uh, uh, young children no longer form a correct reflection of the past. It is worrisome. It is worrisome. And I'm, I'm not talking of purity of language. I'm not a lang language puritan. I'm a language uh, actually opposite of puritan, what an experimenter. Yes, other questions? Hi. Good, good afternoon, sir. I'm asking you two questions on behalf of two of my friends who couldn't be here. The first question. I am reading out her message. Sir, as you said yesterday, language is tied to metaphysics. Since the complexity of language is declining, speech, or what we understand as speech acts in the phenomenological tradition, is also declining. And we are moving towards a repertoire of visual significations that is not enough to explicate or capture our internal plurality of the mind or the interior landscape of our mind. What do you think is the sort of metaphysical landscape of the visual repertoire that we are heading towards? This is question number one. Question number two is, what role or rather ethics does the language professor or the teacher of literature have to use to uphold uh, or foreground this plurality of languages in an attempt to slow or maybe optimistically stop its death? Thank you. Very good question. For, other, for others who are not familiar with phenomenology, let me uh, quickly say that this is a philosophy coming from Heidegger, Mondoponti, Sartre and so on. The centerpiece of that philosophy is mutual engagement, intersubjectivity. 
and the only vehicle humans know for intersubjectivity is language, whether nascent or expressed. I say nascent language, that is what we call intuition. While we not fully form the thought, but it's emerging. So intersubjectivity through intuition, through languages of many kinds, not just the language of words, it can be uh, the, the ability of humans to grasp the thought in somebody else's head, where words are explicitly not used, that ability is shaped by the language ability. And uh, so, the phenomenological intersubjective uh, engagement, interlocking of the consciousness with the rest of the world, will become weakened in absence of language as we know. But the visual language, I mean we are using the term language for the visual in a metaphorical sense. Uh, we have to evolve some new term for that. That's a different business as far as, uh, as far as the brain is concerned. The visual is reaching your brain through the eyes, not through the ears. I don't know the distance between the analytical equipment inside prefrontal cortex or whatever it is, but the visual perception is faster. It is the gestalt of experience. Language is analytical. The input itself is in the form of analysis. Uh, I mean, uh, how will I say? Sugar and laddu. No, granular sugar. Language is like that. But big lump of jaggery. So visual perception is qualitatively different. It comes in the form of a gestalt, as a combine, as a as a and for that. Phenomenology want to work. It is not intersubjectivity. It is interobjectivity. And what that branch of philosophy will be called, I do not know. Uh, but uh, it deserves a new name. And that new name will not come in the form of a word. It will come in the form of a logo. Good evening, sir. Um, so my question to you is, what are your thoughts on the possible proliferation of language on the virtual space, in the virtual space? And I ask this fully aware, of course, uh, and forgive me if I ramble because your talks have been very thought-provoking, but um, I ask this fully aware of the dangers that you have brought up in today's talk of you know the accumulation of artificial memory and the virtual space as it is also you know be essentially reducing language to binary and the fact that of course I'm aware that multiple there are multiple layers of people behind the switchboards who have access to this data, access to this memory. And and from what you've also mentioned a little of your earlier talk on on uh, the first talk of how language is being weaponized, I can see also how the dangers of the virtual space and that memory that is accumulated can, is in this day and age also being weaponized against us by selling our privacy, selling our data. But what are your thoughts on the possibility of this space equally being a space where with the right kind of policy making, with the right kind of protection of our memory and of this data, of these rights, of this space and making it a space that could possibly nurture the proliferation of language. Yeah, uh, I mean, I will not, uh, I will not equate virtual space with surveillance of the state. The states have been uh, uh, watching, observing the citizens from ancient times. Uh, now they have better technology, better equipment. They are using every new technology they use for. I mean, at one time they used thumb impression for a passport or application, then photograph. Now, through this technology, this technology, they are keeping an eye on everybody. Because the state is in a great rush to become God, to control everything. But the virtual space is something different. And it is, just as we move out of nature, in the process of evolution, humans kind of made a quantum leap. 
because of the uh, recursive brain, the kind of brain we have, and became anthropological. Now we are moving into yet another advanced, when I say advanced, I am not attaching any value to it, that better or something, but a different kind of existence. And that existence uh, is bringing to us craving for being like aliens, free of physics, free of chemistry, or as in the metaphysics, nainam dhati pavaka, nainam chindanti shastrani, nainam dhati pavaka. The weapons will not chop us, fire will not burn us, rains will not wait us in the no, of course, rains. <coughs> we have a new craving, new desire, and that virtual space is a replacement that we are trying to create for life. Perhaps it is space where the dreams are, our tacit, our unstated dreams are. All of us are dreaming that without our knowledge, collectively we are dreaming that where life will neither have end nor beginning. It will be a forever existence. Uh, it will be an existence which will not be diminished by the pressure and the, uh, the, the, the impact of uh, laws of physics, laws of chemistry, laws of biology and so on. We, the virtual space is not a desire for death. Virtual space is a desire for deathlessness and life of a different kind. But it will not be life the way we recognize life in a, a tuna moon, in a you know, blade of grass and so on. Uh, that we have no, not enough understanding of that life. And therefore we do not know how the network societies will function in future. We are confused. We are, we are confused like a, a herd of sheep or goats being taken to the butchery. Uh, we know that we will be butchered, but we don't know whether we will be made into uh, uh, fried uh, mutton or uh, roasted mutton or uh, barbecue. Uh, we just don't know. We know that so uh, uh, humans uh, 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 human intellect is a, a great thing. It has taken several million years for us to come at to this stage. And humans are capable of solving problems. The problems can be solved if problems are raised. And I was only thinking that, you know, the alarm, alarm. I don't have the solution. I don't have the, uh, the, 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 the bandwidth to uh, really imagine how language will be in the virtual space. But uh, uh, if I did not ring the alarm, who, how would somebody else in the next generation think of that? That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will take two more questions. I'm not terrified of the virtual space. I'm terrified of language death. I'm not terrified of the nice dinner, but I'm terrified of being butchered. Yeah, I have a very quick question. You have expressed your concern about dying languages. But what about languages which are getting partitioned, divided? Take the example of Punjabi and Sindhi. What my Punjabi friends say that we in east eastern side, that is in India, we use a Gurmukhi script. Whereas those in Pakistan, we are using the Shamu. They are using the Shamukhi script. So we can't read each other. And several years later, when we meet at conferences, I find that their academic vocabulary has changed, whereas in India, it is more getting more sensitized, and there it is more Persianized or Arabic, which it was not so 70 years ago. So what is the future of a language of this kind? Or of Sindhi, for example. Will it be one day Punjabi of India and Punjabi, though they, they are not dying people, large numbers speak, but the languages are getting divided. So what is the fate of a language of this kind? And should we somehow try to integrate them? Languages by their very definition of a language do not understand national boundaries. 
when Bangla in Bangladesh, and, but nations in order to secure their identities impose on language these false borders. I'll give you Sindhi and Punjabi are larger examples. There is a language called Karen. It's spoken in Burma, what I used to call Burma, now Myanmar, uh, unless they have changed the name again in the present regime. Karen is a border language of Myanmar, is also spoken in Andaman and in Mizoram. These boundaries, now Karen in Andaman is written in Devanagari because the nation wants the current speakers of Andaman to belong to the Devanagari nation. So, nations are relatively shorter, uh, historically shorter uh, in the category with histor uh, short historical span. A nation in the beginning meant people, but the nation state is something different from people, it's a way of managing people. Language is a, uh, is a, uh, has a longer, as a category, longer historical term, and therefore languages will survive nations. Language uh, conflicts were used in many nation creations and nation destruction in Ireland, North and South Ireland, Gaelic and English, Celtic and English, Korea, Bangladesh, and so on. But uh, nations, uh, nations are a fragile category. Language is substantial category. And perhaps languages will survive nations, perhaps. This uh, Tower of Babel uh, tells me that uh, when one language is broken, I mean, just as a story, many languages speak. When one nation breaks up, only other nations feed on the broken nation. When one language breaks up, as Sanskrit, many new, or Latin, many new languages come. Uh, nation states are cruel by nature. Languages are very kind by nature because they allow communication. Nations thrive on boundaries. Languages thrive on crossing boundaries. I mean, I'm putting this in a stark opposition, which is oversimplification. But uh, uh, the focus of your question uh, forced me to uh, answer that. Thank you. And I, I do, if, if a script and script and language have no mechanical correlation, any language can be written in any script because script is not language. Script emerged initially as an arrangement of arithmetical symbols. Scripts did not fall from heaven for some languages to use those scripts. Even Devanagari has not come from Devas. It has come from Vanyas. Languages are developed by people and scripts are developed by merchants at a certain stage in social development of that language. And therefore the, the script of the most capricious merchants, the English people, has uh, become more universal than other scripts. <laughs> yes. Good evening, sir. Uh, I had two questions and I would, uh, I'm looking forward to your response to that. Um, so one was an experience, the first one. Uh, last year Durga Puja, I was at Jai Mahal and um, I come across this parent who is a Bengali who is talking to her child in English and clearly uh, something that I realized the, children, the child does not know how to speak in Bangla because maybe uh, they were born and raised in Bangalore and the parents thought that, you know, it would be better if the child speaks English rather than their mother tongue, right? So, I wanted to have, like, I wanted to know your response to nowadays how a lot of parents or maybe, you know, a lot of people who think learning English is making them smart or if you do not know English, 
you're not smart enough? Is it not similar to how, like, you know, I mean, around, like, yeah, in the past, yeah, yeah, in the past, is it not similar to, like, if you know Sanskrit only, then you're smart? So yeah. it's very similar in, to the that. The most gifted linguist in the, in the, in the in India was Suniti Kumar Chatterjee. Suniti Babu was a phenomenal person, it's called great scholar. Chatterjee, Suniti, yes, Chatterjee. Today, uh, children don't. St Today, uh, children don't study Chatterjee. They study Chatterjee. <laughs> That's the answer to me. GPT or whatever that chat. I, I even don't know the name. So, Chatterjee or Chatterjee is the choice. You have to decide. In Bengal, in Gujarat, in the same school. It is sad. It is sad. sad. Thank you very much, Professor Devi, and uh, thanks everybody uh, over here. I would like to now invite uh, Aditi and Mahima, secretaries of the Communication Club, to offer the vote of thanks. Wow, three days have already come to an end. We'd like to begin by extending our gratitude to Professor G. N. Devi for taking the time out of his busy schedule to give a lecture over here over three days at Mount Carmel College. I'm sure everyone's taking back different things from these three days, but your thoughts and insights will continue to stay with us, sir. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to Professor Surekha Devi. On behalf of the NCBS, we would like to thank the Obed Siddiqui family and TNQ Technologies for their constant and generous support throughout. We would like to thank the Department of Communication Studies, our professors Sharon Ma'am, Dr. Shahana Ma'am, Nitin Sir and Chinmay Sir for their continuous support. We would like to thank NCBS for the wonderful opportunity to collaborate and we hope that this is just one of the many that's yet to come. Professor Satyajit Mayer, uh, Mr. Venkat Srinivasan, Dr. Umar Ramakrishnan, Ramakrishnan, Professor L. Shashidhara and the whole team at Archives, thank you for making this event possible. We'd like to especially take time to thank Samira Agnihotri who coordinated everything with us endlessly on behalf of NCBS. We'd also like to thank the management of Mount Carmel College and our principal Dr. George Lekha for giving us the opportunity to do this. Our support staff, Benny sir and Lal sir, thank you for helping us throughout. I'm sure we're speaking for everyone when we extend our thanks to Abhirami Ravi of Crumble Cookies for the mouth-watering refreshments she's given us for the last three days. I'm sure a lot of us are going to remember the taste of your carrot cake and chocolate, co chocolate chip cookies. Um, we also want to thank Mr. Prabhakaran from Orient Black, Black Swan for making Professor G.N. Devi's work available and accessible to us. Lastly, we'd like to thank our team that did everything from creating posters, handling tech, photography, videography, ushering, and even moving tables uh, and chairs last minute. We were so, uh, you were so enthusiastic and willing to do anything and everything that needed to be done. This event could not have happened without you. Thank you. We'd like to invite our core team on stage. faces that you saw around you were the ushers, our first years, who are extremely instrumental in making sure the event happened smoothly. Thank you.